Hello, it's Jay Deer speaking with a brief discussion of the final part of M882, Managing the Software Enterprise. It's in the nature of a, a 5,000 foot flyby, not a detailed inch by inch search of the ground, um, just to give you a brief overview of the course materials for part three, and also a couple of pointers on the TMA and the exam coming up as well. So the first part of the course is about managing resources. Uh, we talk about organisational structures, how organisations work, matrix management, that sort of thing. And then into one of the key areas for people managing software projects, which is how big is it? How do you understand the size and scale of a project and put some estimates and numbers around it for time, team, effort and so on. Um, key issues here about define the scope. How can you outline the scope of the business process and what part of that will be automated or not automated? That's the context diagram. You talk about what the inputs are, what's the process is that's automated and what the outputs are. Um, then goes into a data flow diagram, how you can look at what elements of data might be input, might be received by system to system communication, might be stored, managed, transferred, output to document systems, screens, whatever. Um, and those are good mechanisms for getting a scope of a project uh, and be able to discuss it with people because it's not a one-off activity, you don't do it and it's done. Typically you'll review it with subject matter experts in different areas uh, just to agree what the scope is. Having got that, there's a number of techniques for producing estimates of how much effort, how much time, what team size you're going to need for actually doing the development of a project. We look at a couple of those in the course materials, in particular one called Kokomo. Um, which looks at things like function points, how many screens are there, how many data stores are there, how many elements of data. And there's a lot of weightings applied, how complex is this you're looking at, have you done it before, those sort of weighting factors that enable you to look at what needs to be done, how big it is, and come up with some numerical answers. One comment I make here about uh, in real life, it's really a good idea to do some estimates, do some projects, and then keep a record of what the estimates were and what the projects were, so you get in your organisation, the sort of tools you're using, the sort of development you're doing, you get an understanding of how accurate your estimates are, what sort of weightings you might need to apply, whether you need to expand the time allowed for testing, or whether you need to increase the development time, whatever. Uh, history of your organisation's activities with the way you do things is a good thing to keep. Then the course moves on to look at configuration management. So what, what do we mean by configuration? It's wider than many definitions people often use. It includes not only the code that's used for a particular deployment, but also all the artifacts around that, things like requirement specifications, diagrams, the data flow diagrams, uh, the code itself, the source code, the compiled code, test scripts, uh, test plans, all of those things make up a configuration, a configuration being a set of something that's, that's deployed. Um, the reason for all of those things is they can all change. Uh, if you change the requirements, for example, and a subsequent release has slightly different requirements, then test plans need to change, the code needs to change, uh, and so on. So keeping a uh, handle, keeping control of what's been specified, what's been built, how you know it's been built to the specifications, is configuration management. And we look at a number of tools that can do that, and some of the principles and processes behind it, uh, things like checking things into a configuration store and checking them out again, so there's a record of what state they're in, uh, change control process, how do you initiate changes, how do you approve changes, uh, fairly common behaviour. The third element of the course is looking at uh, software quality, and there's some generic quality management systems like uh, ISO 9000, that some may, many of you may have come across, but al also there's some specific ones related to software, we look at things like CMMI, the Capability Maturity Model, and SPICE, uh, which is, I can't remember the acronym for that, but it's, it's a model around how you manage software and your organization's ability to deliver quality software. And then the final part of the course is looking at uncertainty and risk. We talk about uh, risk in projects being in three different areas. One is organizational risk. That's something like a change in the market, a change in relationship with customers. So maybe your, your IT vendor, EDS, is being bought by an IT supplier, HP. That's an organizational risk. There's also the concept of project risk. Can you meet the cost and the quality and the schedule uh, within the project? What about staff turnover? That's sort of pro typical project risk. Um, and there's a technical risk. Um, will a third party component do what it says it do? Will you get the performance that you need? Um, 
are the requirements actually accurate? That's a technical risk as well. Do the requirements actually meet, uh, match what the real requirements are? So there's three sorts of risks, organisational, project and technical. Um, a key quote here from uh, Leveson, uh, that most accidents, by which you mean failures of software, are not the result of unknown scientific principles, rather of a failure to apply well-known standard engineering practices. So for many of the things going on, they've been seen before, maybe not in your organisation, maybe seen somewhere else, but they are known and able to be managed. Uh, but if you don't take the steps to manage them, they're likely to cause problems. Um, so there's four key mechanisms for risk management. And one is risk avoidance. You know it's a risk, so you decide to do it differently so that risk doesn't occur. Uh, risk reduction. So you know it's a risk, okay, we'll make that risk smaller by having another iteration of testing, spending more time checking the requirements are right, doing some evaluation of the third party components. You do something to reduce the risk. Um, you can risk retention. You say, yeah, okay, I know that's a risk, but we're going to push on anyway. So maybe it's a risk that this other project won't complete on time, but we're not going to wait for that project to finish. We'll carry on in parallel and we'll just hope, cross our fingers that they do, uh, they do synchronize. Um, and there's risk transfer. Uh, risk transfer means somebody else bears the, the problem if, if that risk occurs. So that's sort of like an insurance policy. Um, but also outsourcing is a source of risk management. You write the contract to say, okay, you, Mr. Vendor, are required to deliver on such a date, if not there's penalties. So that's the quick flyby of the course contents for part three. Um, now a couple of comments around the TMA. Uh, there'll be questions on all of those areas. Um, on organisational structures, use of resources, on estimating, on risk, on quality. Um, but key principles, as always, key principles, answer all parts of all questions as they're written. Right? If it says evaluate something, don't describe it. Right? If it asks you to use a particular method, use that particular method. Um, Stick to the word count. Do you have to keep saying this to people? People are, in my group anyway, some people are submitting essays significantly above the word count and you lose marks for it. Um, and also use references. References to the course materials, case studies, external authors to support your arguments. Last couple of questions in the TMA are looking for more overall statements. It's not just about the course contents of part three, it's the course as a whole. Uh, so again, you're asked to evaluate things. Uh, drawing on your readings of the course uh, text, TMA papers and case studies, for example, one of the phrases used. Uh, how can you demonstrate that you are evaluating in, in the context of the whole course? Well, it's the same things as before. It's using quotes, it's using references to the course materials and external authors and the course the case study papers to demonstrate that you have worked with, understood, tackled, engaged with the materials of the course. So. We're not looking really here for personal opinion, we're looking for how well you can relate the questions back to the course as a whole. And that's all I'm going to say about the TMA. Finally, a comment or two about the exam. Those of you who've looked at the exam questions and structure, um, good. If you haven't done that, I think you should start looking now. I know it's not come out for some time. But there's quite a lot of pre-work for the exam. It's not just revising the course materials and being tested on it. There's a very, some very specific tasks for part two of the exam. You have to look, you a, you have to choose a theme. There's three different themes outlined and you could choose one of them. So it's a decision about you as to which area of the course you're most interested in or most comfortable with. Then you have to read a paper that's provided on that theme. You then have to do some research and find another paper that is relevant, that is uh, relevant to the subject matter, that is recently recent and is academic. It's published in an academic journal. It's not. Uh, PC magazine or something, you know, it's, it's a, an academic study. Um, and you have to think about how you compare the paper you've chosen with the paper that's been given on that topic. And there's some questions given in the exam themes to say you'll need to answer these questions, and there's some questions you're not given as well. So you have to be prepared to do quite a bit of exam pre-work, not only revision, but this question of choosing a theme, picking a paper, reading a paper that's given to you, doing some comparison work, being prepared to reuse that in the exam, some of the questions known, some of the questions not known. And with that I'll say good luck with the DMA and with your exam preparation. Okay, bye!